Hi, Misha here, and this is my second episode looking at Japanese warships. Again, using the Eagle Moss models in 1100 scale, although I do have one Atlas edition, which is slightly smaller and 1250. But all four are die cast. And today, we're going to talk about the most active battleships that Japan had in World War II, and really, the most active battleship class of World War II, the Congo, or Congo class, of four ships. These actually started life as battle cruisers, and then were updated to be battleships and fast battleships before World War II. Had a very long service life. And one of them almost made it to the end of World War II. I mean, just a few weeks. <laughs> but all served in World War II. Here we have the Conga herself. This is circa 1944. Here we have her sister ship, Haruna. This one's from 19. This is it, 28. Yeah. Over here we have the next ship. Actually, the first one to be launched after Conga. This is He or Hie or Hai or Hai H I. E I. I've heard it pronounced so many different ways, I don't know. He is how I always thought, but it doesn't really matter. And this is circa 1935, when it was being used as a training ship, and also it was officially declared the Emperor's ship. So, that's kind of neat. This isn't when it's fully demilitarized, because it has its one of its two rear cannon, or turrets back, but not the other. And then finally... The oddball in the group, <laughs> the Kaishima, circa 1942, again from Atlas. The Congo, Conga, has the distinction of being the last Japanese warship to be built outside of Imperial Japan. These were constructed in response to HMS Invincible. Technically the world's first battle cruiser. Battle cruiser being very similar to a battleship in armament, but faster and slightly lightly armed compared to a battleship. <laughs> and these were started off as battle cruisers. Japan was trying to modernize their navy after the Russo-Japanese War, and in 1910-1911, the Japanese parliament authorized an emergency naval plan, which included construction of four battle cruisers and one additional battleship, which was the Fuso class. My speech, by the way, pronounces that Fuss class. <laughs> Anyway, that'll be it for another video. <clears throat> the Congo got its start when the Japanese Navy signed a contract with Vickers in the UK in November of 1910 to build for them the first ship. The hull was based on the Lion class but had several upgrades and advantages. It was just over 700 feet long, had a projected speed of 27 and a half knots. It was to be armed with eight 12 inch guns for the main battery and would have a crew of around 1200. But it, just about a year later, after the hull was well underway, the uh, 
sales rep at Vickers did his job and sold the Japanese on the new 14-inch gun that Vickers had been working on. So literally at the 11th hour, the design was updated to take a larger cutting edge gun. This would actually make the Konga class the most advanced battle cruiser in the world when it was first launched. And uh, these would be built uh, when while Konga was being built in the UK, Japan would send delegations over to take notes and, and talk about construction techniques and everything else. Therefore, they were able to lay down her sister ships beginning in late 1911. Congo, of course, would be the first ship commissioned in 1913, followed by Haiya, and then Kirishima. And then Harunu would be the, the youngest one. The first two would be in service before World War I, and the last two would come into service in 1915. So all would take place in some degree in World War I. And would prove quite revolutionary. They were considered such good ships that they actually influenced some later British designs, like, for example, HMS Tiger. They really did have very good technology. So much so that after World War I, Japan planned to build four more, but the Washington Naval Treaty put pay to this. And again, after Japan abrogated the London Naval Treaty in the 1930s, they thought again about building more. But they had other priorities like, well, for example, the Guy Grantuan Yamato class amongst carriers and everything else. So, these four would be the Congo class. But each one would have a long history and, quite frankly, a very interesting one. So, let's kind of focus on each ship for a few minutes and uh, talk about their individual service, although oftentimes these would operate together in pairs or even sometimes, like, for example, at the Battle of Midway, they would nearly all be there, at least in the general theater. Alright, let us begin with Hiei, the first one to be built in Japan, and then we'll get into Kurushima, the second one. Like I said, Hiei was in service just before World War One. Kurushima would come into service in early 1915, and both would have patrol duties during World War I, making sure there were no shenanigans outside of uh, Japanese waters and the Pacific and whatnot. In uh, 19... 21 through 23, we have the Washington Naval Treaty, which set tonnage limits and also set a moratorium where Japan could not build new battleships or battle cruisers until 1931. So they decided to rework their existing ships. Now, um, before the, anything would happen, Kurishima here would assist delivering supplies and aid, providing assistance after the Great Kanto Earthquake in 1923, which devastated Tokyo and many other Japanese provinces and cities besides. Then in 1924 and 25, both ships went through their first refrit, although it was a minor one. They'd both been in service for about a decade, so... A little bit of change to the anti-aircraft armament, things like that. Both would kind of have patrol duties and go in and out of reserve as needed throughout the 1920s. But in the late decade, their fates would uh, quit, uh, quite diverge. Hiei here would actually be stripped down in 
1929 to comply with the Washington Naval Treaty to keep Japan under the tonnage limit, and she would be turned into a training ship, school ship. But Japan knew what they were doing, and they knew they would reactivate her. So they did remove most of her armament and her arm -er, but they very carefully mothballed it, where it could easily be brought back. And uh, it would pretty much serve as a training ship through uh, 1933. Kirishima, on the other hand, would go in for a major refit and be turned into a battle ship beginning in 1931. This was, at this time, mostly giving it additional armor and updating its engines a bit and, and sort of other things and going to the so-called Bakoda uh, mast. Well, Hiei would not be a training ship for all that long. At that time, when she was, she had no rear turrets. But in 1934, Japan walked out on the Washington Treaty, and in 1935, they would walk out on the London Naval Treaty. They felt that it was very biased in favor of the U.S. and Great Britain, and you know, in a way, they weren't wrong. So free to do whatever they wanted, again, without any tonnage limits, they started pulling stuff out of storage for Hiei. And one of the first things they did was reinstall one of the rear turrets. And in 1935, she was commissioned as the Emperor's personal ship, meaning she was used for a lot of ceremonial duties and was fitted out as a luxurious flagship and given back quite a bit of defensive capability. She had only served for about two years in this role, and then in 1937, she would go back in for her second major refit, which would end at the beginning of 1940, and Kirishima too would go in for her second major refit, and at this time they were reclassified as fast battleships, meaning they were capable of going over 30 knots, 30 and a half knots to be exact which was an important number because it meant they could keep up with Japan's carrier fleet. It also meant they were fully rearmed. They were given new secondary guns, ones capable of being dual purpose. Their eight 14 millimeter guns were still intact. They had torpedo bulges in addition to new armor. And the hulls were lengthened to about 720 feet to give them better uh, hydrodynamics and, and so on and so forth. And their crews were increased up to 1,500 men because of a lot of the new sensor equipment, electronics, and whatnot. Also, they were equipped with a catapult to launch planes. They carried float planes since the 20s but now they were able to launch them with catapult. So while they were old battleships, they were rather modernized. In 1941, both ships helped escort and protect the attack group that went against Pearl Harbor. And so they were there. They didn't really do anything, but they were there just in case on December 7th. And then they would continue to provide an escort role in early 1942, being there at the attack on Darwin. And they would be there, in fact all four would be there, at the Battle of Midway, although they didn't really do a whole lot. They would continue to kind of poke around a bit throughout 1942 until Guadalcanal. To put it bluntly, Hiei would be the first of the four sister ships to go to the bottom of the ocean. She was attacked by bombers, 
She was also hit with torpedoes. Repeatedly, she took a good amount of beating for about a day. And uh, while damaged and unable to go under her own power and steerage, they did try to tow her. Kirishima did try to tow Hiei, but had to cut her loose when things were looking desperate. Therefore, she would uh, sink. It said that maybe the crew scuttled her on November 13th. So she was the first one to uh, be taken out of action. But it wasn't over yet. And the second major naval engagement of uh, Guadalcanal. Beginning on the 14th, Kirishima would engage several American ships, including South Dakota. And uh, this would actually be the first time in World War II that there would be a battleship duel in the Pacific, ship-on-ship. Uh, -ship. It was started off as a nighttime duel, and the problem was... Kirishima had been loaded with high explosives because she had been bombarding. They both had been bombarding uh, Henderson Field in October and in November. They'd been bombarding the island. So she did not have her high, her armor-piercing shells loaded. Whereas, of course, the American ships that gave her the jump did. Nevertheless, she uh, went to battle stations and closed to a close-in engagement. And it was just a slugfest of broadsides It pretty point-blank range, at least by the standards of 1942. She was hit multiple times, and while she was well modernized and competently run, she was nevertheless a 30-year-old design. And her armor was not as thick as newer ships, and American ships were firing 16-inch guns, and so her armor belt was pierced. Flooding happened. Um, on And she, she limped along for a bit. And there were actually attempts by other Japanese ships to tow her as well. But eventually she capsized. And went over, under excuse me on November 15th. While a number of men lost their lives. Well over 200. Considering how large her crew was, over a thousand were saved though. So there is that. So after many decades of service, in one engagement lasting just a few days, two of the four Congo classes were at the bottom of the ocean, never to be seen again. But the story, of course, is, is far from over. Next up, let's talk about the youngest ship, Haruna, and the Oldest ship, Conga. These two often worked together in World War II. So, good to put them together. Conga was obviously in service throughout World War I. But uh, Haruna was rushed into service in 1915 and did patrol some. But really the first event of note for her was a bit of a sad one. In 1920, in September, during a gunnery practice routine, one of her guns exploded. A shell got stuck in the breach and detonated, destroying, or at least basically destroying, number one turret and killing seven sailors and injuring more. So it did some pretty good damage, and since this is 1920... War is not happening. Essentially, she was put into reserve for a bit to see what happened. But uh, Conga, who'd been doing some patrol work and generally just a thing, would go in for the first minor refit in 1924, surviving the naval treaty, and would come out of that. Haruna would be pulled out of reserve around 1926 and go through her first update. During these, they were basically giving them uh, a slightly better anti-aircraft and, and tinkering with their main guns. And of course, in Haruna's case, making sure all repairs were done. 
Then of course would be the program to update them from battle cruisers to battle ships. Both would be given float planes and uh, increased. One thing I didn't mention when they went from their when they increased their armor and everything, they went from displacing about twenty seven thousand tons, so quite respectable, to uh, thirty two thousand tons. So definitively a true true battleship, which uh, at that time the maximum allowance was thirty five anyway. So. They were already tipping the scales. But yeah, both would go through the program coming out between 1933 and 1935. When Congo came out in 33, she would be used as the flagship for a couple of years. And when uh, Haruna came out in 35, she would be used in the second Sino. Japanese War in 1937 is basically a giant troop ship taking Japanese troops to the mainland of China. Then they would go in and be fast battleships, of course, and made ready for World War II. Whereas the first two we looked at took direct escort for the Pearl Harbor attack. These two were actually sent in a different direction and were there during the invasions of Manila and Singapore. After that they would be used in early 1942 for other escort duties, mostly in the southwest Pacific. They would both be there during the Battle of Midway, at least for the main group, but they would be on the northern end, and they would actually go north and uh, escort and cover the invasion of the Aleutian Islands. So again, they had their own kind of deal. Moving on, they would again see action at Guadalcanal, but survive it with relatively minor damage. 1943, they would return to Japanese waters, at least sometimes, including going to the QA or QA Naval Arsenal or Dockyard, where they had their anti-aircraft abilities upgraded, as well as their armor. Throughout 1943, they would be sent on missions in the Pacific. Some were patrols. Many were transport and cargo freight missions, including making sure valuable petrol got where it needed to go. While they definitely were stuck out there, they weren't just kept back, they never really engaged Allied surface forces in 1943. So it was all in all, pretty uneventful year. And then it would be the major battle of the Philippine Sea in June of 1944. And again, they would be there doing battleship things. They would also see their anti-aircraft armament again upgraded. In fact, at one point, Conga would have over 120 anti-aircraft guns. Unfortunately, they were the Japanese 1-inch or 25mm, at least most of them. It, which was not a great gun. It was slow to aim. and had a very small magazine for an anti-aircraft gun, especially one going up against 1944 aircraft like the, uh, the Hellcat and even the F4U. It might have been okay if they were still going against Brewster Buffaloes or even F4F Wildcats, which were still in service, but yeah. But yeah, it would, uh, they'd both be porcupining with uh, anti-aircraft guns. They would be there in October of 1944 for the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And uh, they would help sink an Allied escort carrier as well as a handful of destroyers, although they would take some damage but they would both survive 
in during a retreat through the uh, Formosa Strait, the Taiwanese Strait today. And that would be where Congo would meet her end on uh, November 21st she was spotted by the uh, USS Sea Lion who would fire four torpedoes two would strike her both on the same side which is important for sinking because it means you're out of balance Another one would actually go and strike a, a different Japanese ship. So she would be hit pretty hard, taking on water. She would uh, limp along, quite literally, for some time. But then her magazine exploded and the ship just came apart like a tin can. And unfortunately taking most of her crew with her. I think uh, about 250 might have survived, but, but not much. Therefore, she went to the bottom, and then there was one. Haruna, while damaged, would get back to the Kua Naval Yard in 1945 in Japan and dock. She would have her damage repaired, and she would be moored there, and that would basically be her end. By this point, 1945, they did not have the extra resources to really sail her again nor any real reason to do it the allies had the ocean they had the air submarines were everywhere she was safest just left in port and that's where she remained not uh, really moving throughout the spring of 1945 and she almost made it to the end of the war oh so close less than a month but on July 28th, Allied bombers found her, and she was hit by eight or nine bombs, depending on which source you read, and with that many holes in her, plus just sitting neglected more or less for half a year, she quickly sank in the shallow water while still at her moorings. That would actually not be her end. Two years later, 1946, she would be raised to clear the rent lane there and broken up for scrap for salvage. Meaning, actually, of the four, she was the only one that was even salvaged to some extent. The others sank in deep water, and that's where they rest to this day. And there we have the, the Congo class, or Conga class. Of course, all the Eagle Moss models have the same features. They are slightly different from each other. Obviously the uh, Hie or Hia is the easiest to tell because it doesn't have the rear turret and it doesn't have a lot of other things because it's still in the training slash imperial guys. The uh, and that's from 1935 I think I said that but anyway the Haruna is actually circa 1928. So that would have been right as she was being transformed into a uh, into a legitimate battleship, but before she was a fast battleship. Yeah, here she is right here. So she does have float planes, but no catapult. I think this one's neat because it's a transitional stage. And then Conga here is actually from 1944, so chronologically the latest of all of these. She has the catapult, full turrets, and she has lots of little anti-aircraft guns. And the modern Pakoda mast. And these did, in the World War II, get... Radar sets, although of course the Japanese radar was much more primitive than the ones that Americans used. Still, they had them. So you can probably see some changes there. Of course, each one came with a magazine, and they come with these Japanese named stands. And uh, they're pretty heavy models. 
the uh, the Atlas being a slightly smaller scale has a little less detail in some ways it does have a bit of a nicer stand though because the stands made of wood not plastic and it has a metal placard it's also nicer for us because it's actually written in English but what can you do but the Eagle Moss are better ships the larger scale lets them have more detail. They seem to be a little more consistently made. And uh, a little more durable plastic. Has a little more wiggle wobble to it. Eagle Moss has always been pretty good about that. The uh, I haven't really noticed the Atlas being particularly breaky. But I wouldn't want to put it to the test either. You know, in a perfect world I would have the... Uh, Eagle Moss version of this ship too, they do make it, but I already had this one from Atlas, and while I like these, I'm not going to buy the same exact ship twice. So it'll have to make do. Besides, it would look extremely similar to the uh, the Conga over here, just with a few fewer guns. Well, I know this isn't a a plus presentation but I had a lot of fun doing it hope you had fun watching it and uh, yeah I'll come back with episode 3 and uh, we'll go from there and see how much of the Japanese fleet we can cover I greatly appreciate you tuning in if you could like share and subscribe and all that other good stuff this is Misha and I'll catch you very soon next time <laughs>